Welcome back to Birth Podcast. I'm Ash. I'm going to take you right back into my conversation with Pastor Steve Wines in Minnesota. We touch on things like predestination, this idea that the universe has pre-planned things. We talk about liberation and how those two concepts don't actually go together. And we talk about the human condition, divine rightness, tribalism, community, and so much more. Our conversation was incredibly enriching. And so let's jump right back in. There's, there's, there's theory around there that, you know, well, maybe that was supposed to happen for the sake of this thing. And I'm like, that's a predestination message. And I struggle with predestination, which I know is, was even a Christian philosophy at one point. I forgot. Calvin, John Calvin. Calvin. It was Calvin. Yeah. Um, that wrote it. And so, you know, but it's interesting because it's one that I don't necessarily subscribe to because I've become a believer in the aftermath. It's what we do say, feel in the aftermath of the, the aftermath of this thing that has happened that has been harmful. Now, how do we shift and change it for the sake of love, for the sake of mercy, healing, justice, et cetera, for the sake of liberation. Yeah. I love the word liberation. Um, such a strong word. Pre- predestination cannot exist with liberation. Do you know what I mean? Ooh. Like I think, cause if Talk more about that, if, say more about that. Well, I mean, I wonder, I'm just wondering out loud, but if predestination means some people are in and other people are out and that decision was made by the divine before the creation of time somehow, then the people that were out would be the people that would need to be liberated. <laughs> you know, from that unjust system. Yeah. But there and can it also, be no. Yeah, yeah, no. And it challenges, it challenges the notion of, it, it challenges the notion of this, this thing happened. It was supposed to, to get you to that point. But, but wait a minute. No, no, I didn't choose to have this, you know, an LGBT person didn't choose to be excluded. They didn't choose to be abused. Um, women didn't choose to be raped or a man didn't choose to be uh, harmed or shot or raped himself. Like the, the, the people, and this isn't about wallowing in victimhood. This is about the mm-hmm. fact that they ended up in these situations that were the result of somebody else's choice because we all right. have them. So now then you have to say in the aftermath, what do we do with that? In the right. aftermath, how do we gain our liberation? In the aftermath, how do we find the healing and come back to that oneness? I like within? that you know, and that oneness being God or divine or, Mm -hmm. you know. Well, yeah. And like, if, if the divine is not working to bring all things to oneness, you know, then (laughs) why, you know, like, why would we, why would that, for example, if there are people that believe that COVID-19 has been brought to the earth by God as a wake up call or punishment or something. And to that, I say, okay, why would you believe in a divine being that is so uncreative, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that has to do something so awful to, I mean, you would never, uh, even a decent parent. Okay. Just, just a decent parent. Right. wouldn't inflict boils on their child to teach her to do the dishes, you know, or right. something like that. Well, and that's the thing too, um, is, is that you have to look at it and you have to, you have to, you have to flip the scripts a little bit, right? It, it, there is a reaping and sowing effect. Look, the choice was made for humans to invade animal spaces that don't always belong to us. And as a result, their diseases that would not infect them or affect them the same way are going to infect us. So this wasn't divines doing or sacred energies doing. This is the this is really of our own. Now that doesn't mean I want anyone sick. I don't, I don't want anyone no. dead. You know, it's it's a no. matter of this is the result of of those things happening because of decisions that we made. We have a choice. Right. We have a will. I mean, I just got done right. with Westworld, and the whole thing was like you know, whether or not we I have a choice. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. It's so good. I won't give it away. I won't give it away, but I definitely okay. think that like the theme of the the season is, is choice. Yeah. Do we have a choice? Does AI have a choice? Like what is the choice? And, and I think that that that's an element that we, we question every day is do we have a choice and what is that choice? And so I think it at least gives us our own power back when we know that yeah. Yeah. and then brings us before the divine to 
understand ourselves and the world around us a little bit better. So it's in the yeah. aftermath rather than the, than the pre. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. You know, and a vision where human beings have agency um, go, is a better vision than, you know, cause really that predestination view is ultimately victimhood. I mean, you know, or I don't even know what, what that is, but it's, and you know, those of people that need to say, well, God brought this on us. All. That's just another way of controlling what you can't control. That's another go. way of not really is control. To, it's all yeah, about control. Just, yeah. Sociologically groups need to scapegoat in order to survive. I mean, truly and really like a group, group think group. So let's call group think, you know, a patriarchal society in which it's clear the, the men rule and the women cook and men and women are the ones who get married. Um, when we now live in a society where, where um, LGBTQ folks are in the United States anyway, allowed to be married fully. And so um, that confronts that system that says it's wrong, you know? So then we're going to see more scapegoating actually, because there's a clearer confrontation to the closed system. And so, so that's a roundabout way of answering your question. I mean, I think, I think it's, it is individual, you know, there is, there are individual reasons why someone might reject the sexuality of someone else. And that might be psychological, but I think the sociological mind is much stronger even than the individual mind. So that, you yeah. know, Try we will fight, that. we will have to scapegoat someone that's different, especially when the heat gets turned up on our own tribes. And that's a pejorative word, like our own group. Oh no, I, I write about, yeah. I read about that very yeah. much. Very clearly. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So yeah, I, I think it's hard to climb out of the power of groupthink, uh, even well, when we think we're so individual. We're, we're we're actually much more controlled by our group. I mean, exclusion is power. Yeah. Right. You can, if you can exclude someone from a space, from a group, from a tribe. You know, I, I one of the things I actually write about in in my own book is that tribe is the. <laughs> It's the power belonging that we know. It's the one we're sort of born into. It's the one that sort of has the most influence on us. And that ultimately belonging needs to help us create community rather than tribe. I actually differentiate between community and tribe. Tribe has a sort of a, a, a fight, sort of self-preservation, but not necessarily for the good of the tribe. It's just preservation. Whereas community is about the preservation that is far more inclusive. Now, I know that's playing with words, but as a writer, I mean, that's. Just, no, I mean, mind. you're totally right. That's yeah. And you might say tribe is uniformity and community is unity, you know, which is completely different. And I think, you know, back to the, like our, our brains are, have not at all caught up to, the global world that we now live <laughs> you know, our, our, our prehistoric brain is still so terrified when we come into, when we encounter something that's different, you know, that we want to fight, flee or freeze. That's real. Like that's, you know, and so even climbing out of that reality of noticing our triggers when we encounter something that's different, when we encounter someone whose sexual preference is different than us, whose religion is different than us. You know, we have to be honest about that first trigger probably if we're ever going to move beyond it into community and unity because we're, we're going to naturally fight to stay right because we feel like that's oh, no, a survival. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, that's you the know? thing is, is, is you know, I, um, multiple wise teachers across the time and ages have, you know, said things along the lines of, you know, I'd rather, I think, you know, the one I'm thinking of right now is Ram Das. I'd rather be, you know, in love than be right. And there's, there's this sense of like rightism 
that sort of permeates through the human condition for the sake of, of control and power. And we have to sort of set aside our divine rightism for the sake of, of being able to not just be whole within ourselves, but to be able to be unified with others. And we're not always going to be right. We're not always going to be, we want to be, because being right gives us control. But we, yes. have, to, we have to take that away. We have, to, we have to allow that to be taken away from us in order to be free, in order to attain our, our liberation. And live with yeah. the grief. Move yes. through the grief. Move through the grief. Yeah. Nobody wants to face their grief. Nobody wants to face the hard stuff. Well, you know, I, I do think that being wrong feels like dying. Yes. And being right feels like surviving. We're going to fight to survive. But the only way, and, and, and this, I'm, I'm showing my cards where I'm still, I still identify with my native tongue of Christianity in the Paschal Mystery, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That is what I see as the pattern of liberation. You know, it's like there is a dying, a releasing of control that will lead to freedom and liberation of ourselves and others. But we're terrified to release control because we feel like there's nothing after death. The, the aftermath that you talked about that comes when you have grappled with and let go of something that you previously felt like, if I let go of this, I will, I will cease to exist. And then you realize, yeah. oh, you know, I not only have I not ceased to exist, I've become a fuller, bigger, more expansive me. You know. Well, you know what's interesting? You, you bring that up too. So you your your book, you go you start to go through the story of Jacob. You don't go to this part of the story quite yet. I have had my own sort of reminder of Jacob's story recently, and for me, it was when he wrestles with God or the angel or the divine being. Or yeah. And it the storytellers decide to tell us that divinity could not quite overcome him. He kept mm -hmm. fighting, he kept fighting, he kept fighting to win, he kept fighting to be right, because that's what he'd done his whole life. His whole life had yeah. been based off this push to be ahead, to be powerful, to be seen, right, over his twin brother, over his, you know, over his uncle who had two daughters, and it says divinity could not overtake him, so the only way, according to the storytellers, is to touch his socket and hurt his hip, and he spends the rest of his life with a limp, but he also spends the rest of his life with a new name. Yeah. And to me, he would forever be known as Israel, but he would also forever remember his grief, which is his limp, that divinity yeah. touched him. And to me, there's so much power in that story because yeah. it means that when we move through our grief and, and certainly I've, I've had to deal with a variety of griefs in my life. But when I can sit there and there was this particular one I was working through and it was like, Oh, that's going to be my limp. Like there was like a knowing in that, but you know what? I also come out of it with a new name. I come out of it with a new, you know what I mean? But you have to go through it. You have to look at self and you have to look at within and go, this is the reality. This is the truth of that thing and face the parts we don't want to discuss. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that story too, for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is that Israel mean liter literally means one who wrestles with God and humanity and prevails, you know? And so there's a paradox there. Like the other thing I love about it is I've been playing around with an idea that you know, we're all struggling to believe the right thing, whatever the right thing is. And we're all saying, I believe the right thing and you believe the wrong thing. But I think that story reveals like, so here's the theory I'm playing around with is that the great grace or gift of the divine is that she will play our game with us. Uh, whatever our game is, whatever we need to, to play, whatever game we need to play to understand her, she will play that game. I love um, that you just said she. You have warmed my heart. Well, and so for Jacob, that game was wrestling for a blessing. He'd been wrestling for a blessing his whole life, you know. And the fact that the divine couldn't overcome 
Jacob and the wrestling. It, like, so there's one way of understanding that is like, literally the divine couldn't. Another way of understanding that is that the divine wanted to bless Jacob. So she wrestled with him until he could receive what she wanted to give him. You know, it's a beautiful interpretation. And to me, I think the storytellers, when they wrote the story, also point out that maybe Jacob was resistant to that blessing. And so then it goes exactly to your point. So then divine wrestles with him until, you know, finally there has to be a grief to receive. And he finally receives that grief in, in representation, like the limb is a representation, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so there is, there is grief and blessing. Right. That comes from wrestling with the divine. You get both. And that's, that's good. You know, like that's, that feels real because it feels more like a real interaction with a real being where you're going to get both, you know, it's not just blessing or just right. grief. We want to go toward one or the other. They're intertwined because grief yeah. is humbling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're intertwined. You can't see. You can, I mean, I, I still always go back to Heinz Feet in High Places. It's one of my top favorite books. Yes. Yeah, wow. Well, blast so, from the past. I know. It is a book that I feel like I have memorized on some soul level. But I mean, much afraid, the, the, the allegory, much afraid goes to the bottom of the mountain, and the Good Shepherd gives her two companions, and her two companions are sorrow and suffering. Yeah. And she cries out, why would you do this? And the good shepherd says, don't you trust me? You will yeah. need them. Yeah, yeah. To get to the top. Yeah. You will need them. Blessing and grief. Sorrow and sadness. Yeah, like, you know, I think Richard Rohr, you know, I think we both love, but, you know, says everything belongs. And, and maybe it does, you know, maybe the things that we would rather not bring to the top of the mountain with us are the things that without which we would never get there, <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> to the point of, right. Oh, I don't want that. Oh, I don't want the limp. Oh, I don't want, but what if, yeah. What if the very things we would choose to jettison, those are the things we need actually. And I certainly don't mean anything that would be bad, truly bad for us, you know, that we would need to jettison. Certainly there are those things, you know, <laughs> you know, well, you bring, you bring this up in, in the book, you, you say, can you see yourself in the religious leaders, the parents, the villagers, can you see yourself in the different characters of these stories that are told, you know, regardless of what a person believes about the Bible, in my opinion, it, it really comes down to the storytellers included certain elements. A storyteller always has a purpose for the things yeah. that they choose to tell. And, you know, as, as you're a writer and I'm one as well. And so when we tell stories, like there's, there's typically purpose in whatever we're sharing. And, and they chose these characters. They chose these stories. They chose these elements. And so then it's up to us to see where do we see ourselves in this, whether it's the religious leader or whether it's the poor blind guy or whether it's nobody wants to see themselves as the, as the bad guy. Leader. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, uh, that is what is still compelling to me about the Bible. Like, for example, I also wrote um, about the Good Samaritan. So very, you know, even if you're not a Christian, you probably know the story of the Good Samaritan, that there's a guy that's been robbed. He's sitting by the side of the road, priest walks by, leaves him be, and he's half dead. Levite walks by, leaves him be. And then a Samaritan who's looked upon by first century um, religious Jewish people as you know, less than uh, helps him. And then Jesus is telling this story to a religious leader who's essentially asking him, how do I know? How do I know who's in and who's out? And, um, and Jesus said, well, which one of the three, the Levite, the Samaritan, or the priest showed mercy to the man and uh, who was beaten by the side of the road, left half for dead. Um, and we've turned that, that parable largely into a moralistic tale about the importance of being kind to strangers, you know, which certainly is a great virtue. But I think one of the layers that Jesus was trying to get at 
was he was putting the Samaritan man in the same category, like which of the three men, when he said, which of the three men, that was what would have blown everybody's minds because the Samaritan wouldn't even, even been really seen as you, you, like you couldn't, he wouldn't have been placed in the same category as the Levite and the priest. So just the fact that Jesus placed the Samaritan in the same category, he's the one that showed mercy was the revolutionary transformative moment in that story. So can we see the other as being better than us at our own game? That's the, right. can you know, we see right? them as equal in our power? Right. And I think, yes, you know, for example, for example, in, in the West, you know, I really love the stories sometimes that come out that'll talk about uh, how the local mosque was the one that went and fed, you know, the, the, the immigrants or whatever that were left, you know, on the side of the road or whatever, because it's, to me, they're the Samaritan, they're, they're the modern day Samaritans in America. Yep. And it's, can you see them as an equal to you? Yes. Equal in power to you, equal in, in personhood to you, equal in spirit to you. Um, you know, I think it goes a little bit back to the group thing, but that there is a space for which as soon as we can assign an other, we devalue them, we devalue their body, we devalue their space, we devalue their values, even if their values are on the exact same level. Yeah. Right? Even if their belief systems, I mean, most people don't realize that Muslims actually love Jesus. Right. Isa is a very common Arabic name, which is Jesus in Arabic. And so the idea that they say, hey, we just think that there's another prophet and we, we apply it a different way, is that really less than? Do they really not have as much power? With God? Does God really not hear their prayers as much as he hears yours? And I think that that's really important yeah. for us to, to examine because to me, the Samaritan was somebody who actually had as much power as the, and, and the fact that Jesus puts him in that category. Three yeah, it's, people it's, have the power to help him. Yes. Yes. Um, it's amazing. I mean, it's like, and it's also the Bible. Um, let, you know, forget the things that get triggered, but it's just, it, it has a way of mirroring your soul if you let it you know like if you really can dive deeply into it and see yourself sometimes as jesus sometimes as the religious leader sometimes as the blind person i mean what else does jesus mean when he says you know things like if you claim that you can see you're really blind but if you realize you're blind that's when you can see i mean like what else do you th do we think he means by paradoxical statements like that. The Bible wasn't meant to prop up our own convictions and beliefs so that we can hold them over and against someone else. It actually is meant to reveal our blindness, Absolutely. you know, so that we can be free, not to yeah. point out how bad we are. Oh, I agree. I agree. To free us. It's interesting too, because I think one of the groups in the Bible stories, especially in connection with Jesus that gets forgotten are the zealots. Right. Zealots yeah. were kind of, they would be considered today, maybe, maybe kind of the ultra lefties, right? Like yeah. they were the rebels. Yeah. They were the, they were the, you know, freedom fighters. They were the, yeah. right. And they wanted to put him in a suit of armor and lead their army against Rome. They were the complete opposite of the religious leaders. They hated the religious leaders. They hated Rome. They were like, they were the ones who were going to fight and essentially say, fuck the system yeah, <laughs> you know, on right. some level. And he was like, eh. That's not why I'm here. Yeah. That's not yeah. why I'm here. So really, he he addressed the faltering points of groups at every level of exclusion. Yeah. And I think it's really important to remember because sometimes we think that if we go all the way to the other side, oh, okay, well, now we're more, we're better than the other side because we're not this side, right? But yet, oh, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Like it's the same. It's the same it's the language. Same thing. Maybe it's different words, but it's the same exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in my world, um, we see this like, you know, so sometimes people that were used to be super big time fundamentalists, you know, fundamentalist Christian, whatever. And then they, 
you know, they, they radically change their beliefs, but now they're just fundamentalist leftists, <laughs> you know, like they're still fundamentalists. Right. They're just, so exactly what you just said, I'm just saying it in a different way. No, of course. Um, they're, 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 they're playing by the same exact rules of exclusion. They're just playing for the other team now, you know, <laughs> they're really, it's just the same thing. Um, and, um, and in fact, this listening committee that I was telling you about at our church that is leading our congregation through this process of becoming inclusive, one of the guys was that guy, you know, used to be big time John Piper. Now he's very progressive. But it's at some point during the conversation, he said, I realized that I thought I was open minded now, but I just, I was just as close minded as I used to be just for the other team, you know. Um, and so that's a transformative moment when you realize, oh shit, I'm still blind, you know? Right. Um, but that's a good moment. I mean, that's a good moment. I feel like I saw this in Iraq. You know, the example that I always give people is that, look, the, the Iraqi army, they took care of the journalists. We went out with them. They, you know, they helped protect us in a way we think they're the good guys because they're fighting against ISIS. Okay. But then I've got soldiers who would show me videos on their phone of them kicking a suspect and torturing a suspect and yelling at a suspect. And they're so proud of themselves. And, you know, you give them sort of an acknowledgement, hey, they're my protectors right now. Like, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how's that different? Yeah. Is it really yeah. different? Are we... Are we different than, I, you know, our friends at, uh, our friends at, at PLC at Print to Love Coalition wrote a blog once on the same kind of same thing. Like, are there moments that really maybe we're no different than the enemy that we accuse? Yeah. Um, and we have to be really, we have to be aware of that in order for us to once again come back to the, the community and unity. Well, and that's it, right? We don't want to admit that we're playing by the same tactics because that would, again, sociologically, that we would die. We, you know, if we admit that, that we admit that we're wrong, we admit that we're no different than the people we're fighting against, then the foundations upon which our tribe are built will crumble. And so we're terrified of doing it. Right. Um, but that's the only way we move toward community and unity. I hope this conversation was encouraging to you. I hope it made you think and I would love to hear your thoughts. If you want to follow Steve and check out his podcast, buy his book, and learn more, I will put all of those things in the notes section below. May you live and move 